One very important part inside of a wristwatch is a jewel. And we call them jewels because traditionally they were made out of rubies. The jewels of a watch are bearings. The more bearings, the more complex the watch will probably be. So oftentimes, more jewels in a watch is equated to a more complicated watch, something with date functions or timing chronographs, could be perpetual calendars. Those all require a lot more moving parts. And when you have moving parts, you have jewels. Most moving axles or pinions inside of a watch will be set into a jewel. Now the jewel has a hole that goes through it for the axle to rest in. And this acts as a bearing surface. The jewels themselves were made from rubies historically. This was before we had the technology to make man-made sapphire crystals. Now sapphire is actually a better alternative to a natural ruby stone because the man-made synthetic sapphire crystals that we grow in a lab will be less likely to have an inclusion that could lead to cracking either during manufacturing or during use when it's out in the world in a wristwatch for hundreds of years. You have a watch bridge and a main plate that both have a jewel and you'll have an axle that goes between the two. It's almost like a sandwich and the inside of the sandwich is just watch wheels. So the jewel has a very specific outer diameter and a very specific internal diameter, meaning the hole that goes through it, where that axle pivot will rest and turn. Looking back, you'll find some watches that are marked with a ruby count instead of a jewel count. Modern watches today will be marked with a jewel count because in almost all instances, they will be sapphire jewels dyed to look like a ruby instead of an actual ruby. On the bottom side of the jewel, it's completely flat. This is so that a shoulder on that pivot can rest there. On the top of the jewel, there is an oil sink, and that's just part of a sphere that's been ground into the top of the jewel. And that's where we place the oil. That oil will stay put on the jewel because of the surface tension. The jewel surface is a very smooth glass-like surface and that will hold the oil there for many years and keep it from wicking away from the pivot of the watch because we want it to stay right on that moving bearing. We don't want it to dissipate into other parts of the movement. Now these jewels can have all different outer diameters and all different through holes. It just depends on which axle pivot it will be used for. The smaller the pivot, the smaller the hole in the jewel. So we have specialized presses that we use just for pressing jewels into place so that we can make sure that they are perfectly pressed into a bridge or a main plate flat. And these 
presses also allow us to determine how far into a bridge or main plate we press that jewel. We can adjust the jewel up and down to increase or decrease what's called end shake of a wheel. So when you flip a watch from dial side down to dial side up, all of the wheels in the gear train will drop with gravity. Nothing is in there tightly. It's a little bit loose so that they can drop up and down. That way we don't risk screwing down the bridges and tightening onto those shoulders of the pivots, causing the watch to stop. So we do need a little bit of end shake. The adjustment of that end shake is made by moving those jewels in and out of those bridges. So we have special small presses with micrometric adjustments that we can make in case there's too little or too much end shake on any given pivot inside of a watch. The jewels themselves are ground with diamond tooling. And the reason we use diamond is because in order to polish something, you need some sort of abrasive material that can remove material from what you're trying to polish. So if we're trying to polish a sapphire that is only comparable, the only thing harder than the sapphire is diamond, then we need to use diamond in order to remove material from the sapphire. So a thin sapphire thread impregnated with diamond is actually run through that hole until we have just the right size and just the right surface finish that we've specified on a drawing for that jewel. Looking back in history of watchmaking, there was a time period where we hadn't yet developed quartz watches. And so the standard timepiece was necessary, but we couldn't make anything other than a fully mechanical watch. And in this time period, we didn't have synthetic sapphire crystals yet. And rubies were becoming more expensive, but we still needed lots of mechanical watches. In order to have an industrial revolution, especially here in the US, where we had companies like Elgin and Waltham, Hamilton, all making hundreds of thousands of watches, mass producing watches in the US. So we have a time period where you didn't have rubies available for every watch. They were only in the high end what would be considered luxury or railroad grade uh, watches of that time period. Instead of using rubies in all of the standard level timepieces, they would have bushings. And these bushings would be made of metal. And similar to a ruby, they were a bearing surface and they could be replaced by removing metal and adding a new bushing, but they don't last as long and they certainly do not hold the oil as well right on that axle. The reason they don't last as long is because they're significantly softer. Rubies and sapphires are extraordinarily hard. They are almost as hard as a diamond. So they will last a very long time. With dirty oil, what will happen is the axle or pivot turning within that jewel hole will actually absorb uh, or become impregnated with abrasive dust and particles. Mixing with dry oil will create almost like a polishing paste. And this polishing paste will actually wear out the rubies or the jewels and cause them to go from being round 
to being oval. This happens much, much quicker in a watch that has, uh, that has no rubies or sapphires and instead uses a metal bushing because the metal bushing is significantly softer and will wear out quicker. Once we had the technology to man make sapphire crystals, then we saw a lot of the standard or lower grade watches having jewels again. And this is great news because we can actually create those in an affordable manner instead of having to take a rare stone such as a ruby and grind it and prep it to go into a watch, it would be like having to require diamonds be put in your watch for it to run well. Now we have a man-made diamond. So it, it allows a lot more access, which is great uh, for all timepieces now. So the jewels in watches today are synthetic sapphire crystal. And in higher end watches, you'll find that the crystal or the glass covering the dial of a watch is also synthetic sapphire. It's the same material that's used for the jewel. It's just that the jewel is significantly smaller and quite a bit more complex in shape. It's also typically dyed red, but they are the same materials with the same hardness and they will resist wear and scratches and last for a very long time. The jewel count in a watch oftentimes is used as a marketing tool. And a little bit of that comes from the fact that watches have been imported and exported all over the world. And the duties paid on watches actually specify jewel counts. So over a certain number of jewels would mean a certain duty is paid when that watch is going through import or export. We have to label the watch movements with the jewel count. That way, when those watches or movements move across the border, the proper duties and taxes can be paid. Just like marking a country of origin so that we know the right percentage rate or duty amount to be applied to a good, we need to know exactly how many jewels are in that watch in order to properly uh, pay the duties and taxes for import and export. All watches have moving parts and moving parts should have jewels so that they can run efficiently. One of the questions I'm asked the most is what are the jewels? Because jewels are oftentimes thought of as something that makes a watch complex. But it's not the jewels themselves that make the watch complex. It's more moving parts that require more jewels for a watch to run smoothly with the least amount of friction as possible. So next time you look at a watch and you see that there's a jewel count on there, you can think about how many moving parts are in that watch to require those jewels. Mm -hmm.